Okay, I'll just start with a little bit of introduction about this, uh, about, uh, you know, us, about ERA, and then we'll move on to starting the uh, webinar, which is going to be hosted by Nandini, which our speakers are Nandini and Nishad. So uh, I'll just give a brief introduction about what we are doing, and then we'll carry on, and people can carry on joining in. Uh, we had around, I think, some 100 participants who had registered. So there's been a huge like uh, interest, and let's see. I mean, as I think people will carry on coming in as as we go forward. So uh, I'll start with introducing myself. Uh, I'm Arjun. I work as a project manager with the Ecological Restoration Alliance. Uh, when we talk about the alliance, it is an informal network, uh, you know, between, of individuals, organizations, and groups who are coming together to foster this knowledge around ecological restoration of natural ecosystems within India. So uh, the goal of the Alliance is to create a knowledge base and become a hub for, uh, you know, for anyone looking for anything related to restoration. And then that is where you can actually find that. So moving on from that, I mean, the idea of this talk is on citizenship and campaigning, which is not real, it's not, and the reason that, uh, we were thinking about this as the starting in the first series of uh, talks that we have in this webinar is primarily because, you know, even when we think about restoration, there has to be this first layer of having a protected space, having that protected biodiversity. And how do you kind of, I think a lot of research has already shown that uh, irrespective of irrespective of how much we uh, restore, the native old growth forest has it's very difficult to ever recover back to the native old growth forest. And that is why it becomes important to protect the natural heritage that we do have and the biodiversity that we do have. Uh, so that is why it was important that we have this as the first kind of a talk. And uh, I'll, I'll introduce the speakers now. So with us are Nandini Velo and Nishan Saldana from Amche Molan. So uh, Nandini, uh, Nandini works on the human uh, dimension of wildlife management, as well as understanding uh, rainforest dynamics in tropical forests. She works closely with citizens, local forest managers, policymakers, and is engaged with on-ground outreach activities, including healthcare and logistical supports of frontline forest staff, conservation education, citizenship efforts, and writing in the popular medium. Uh, Nishant is an animation filmmaker, independent comic, uh, comics artist known for his character, Mr. Good Guy, and one of the Amche uh, Molan art directors. His work has been featured in uh, Best American Comics in 2019, and he's passionate about photography, Goa, and Bob Dylan. Right? So these are going to be, uh, so Nishant and uh, Nandini, really a warm welcome to you, and thank you so much for joining us for this first talk. And uh, I'm going to now transfer, I'm going to now give it over to Nandini to, uh, so, uh, to present her screen and maybe go over the topic. Uh, just, I think maybe we can have all the questions coming in on the chat and we take it uh, towards the end. Does that work for you as well, Nandini? Or do you, would yes. you? Yeah, Nishant? Yeah, I think that works well for me. Sure, Nishant. that's great. Okay, great. So I think I'll just give it over to you now, Nandini, and you can uh, look forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Arjun, um, and thank you um, to everybody at the Eco, uh, Eco Restoration Alliance, uh, because this presentation has really allowed us um, to think about the alliance that we ourselves have formed with respect to Amje Mole. Um, and it's given us an opportunity in some, self, uh, some sense to think about ourselves um, and really how we got here. Um, so I don't know if you can you all see my screen. Yes. Is it full screen? Not yet. Okay. Cool. Um, so just think, uh, so once again, I would like to welcome all of you and uh, thanks for having us here um, in the first talk. 
and this talk really goes back uh, to what many of you maybe in the alliance fe uh, feel in in the aspect of growing um, back a forest or restoration right um, it might not be a unit of restoration like it might not be a single forest that we're talking about it might not be a universal idea uh, it might not be a fixed trait uh, in terms of what restoration of different landscapes look like, uh, but perhaps it varies in time and space. And perhaps also Nishant and I, uh, in this presentation and this opportunity we have been given um, today, will sort of try to convince you that uh, maybe a restoration and these alliances could be a social construction of growing. Um, so this talk, is dedicated one to the active citizenry that exists uh, in Goa and the other states of, of, of India for forest, for wildlife and our environment. Uh, whether it is in Goa with respect to the Amche Mole campaign or the same uh, Made uh, collective that is coming together or some of the recent uh, findings that we have uh, found with respect to the Italian micro project or the Hing Patkai. Um, many people say, let's not sing to the choir. Um, I was one who would perhaps say that before. Uh, but in these times, I do feel that the choir needs to be uplifted and thanked, uh, especially in the times uh, that we live in. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, like family members that support uh, people who are involved in citizenship and this is a rare opportunity I, I guess where I get to thank my parents uh, today is my mother's birthday uh, and I often think that um, sometimes with respect to the worry of parents it might it's often not reflected but maybe they are as good uh, researchers of worry as um, their kids are um So when we think about um, where environmentalism and citizenship in Goa, uh, I often come back to this quote um, by Frederick Norona in his book, Another Goa, which he says uh, that Goa's baptism happened uh, by fire or by dead fish. So basically Goa's first tryst with environmentalism was way back in 1974 when the Zuari Agrochemicals Factory was shut down to install a costly alternative. Um, so in fish curry rice that I showed you before, the environmental handbook, which was written by citizens and the Eco Forum, this book states that this was the first time in India a factory was shut down because of pollution, right? And that led to uh, costly alternatives having to be instituted by the project proponents. So we also have other processes where citizens have actively participated in decision making um, and this has been costly and this has been wounding so I'd like to commemorate uh, Nilesh Naik who's often known as Goa's uh, first environmental martyr to uh, environmental martyr who was killed in 1995 um, in the nylon 666 ag agitation uh, by police firing and the project was forced to be cancelled I also want to put forward um, the present day uh, challenges that um, exist today when, so the present day challenges that exist today in terms of just the structure and processes um, that exist. So if you look at the three uh, boxes here, uh, it, the first box is the master plan of the Mordmogoa port. Um, and this master plan is basically an idea for the port, which is right along the coast. Um, and it says that a railway line has to be doubled. And I highlight the last line here, which says that the local government has to be pressurized from the center for the completion um, of the doubling of the line. Um, on the right side here is a statement by the power minister, the ex-power minister of Goa, where on the 16th of Jan, uh, 2019, he was um, asked to provide a white paper on the functioning of the electricity department. And what he says is that the department is defunct um, after about 
last six months of being the minister and he says he's unable to provide a white paper on the amount of power one that Goa requires and the status of the distribution of power. Um, move forward to 6 October 2020, uh, his response to citizens was that I will cut power connect connections of the people of Goa. People don't want the Mole power project to come. Um, so this also sort of ties this sort of social typography ties to what I will talk about later, which is uh, Laurent Mermay's paper on the underlying models of organized action for conservation. So in this model, uh, one of the models is that the government um, could be the government uh, could be le like the government uh, could put forth different scales and processes with respect to environmental conservation, uh, but where scientists can be advisors and scientists are intrinsic to this process. But on the other hand, Mermay also says that um, this uh, model also runs the risk when the government no longer thinks about inclusion of people, uh, scientists become, in the words of Mermay, experts to the prince. And then given these challenges, given the social typography, the governance that exists, um, I feel like with respect to the Mole campaign um, that I want to sing again. Um, and I want to sing again to the choir um, because like Nilesh Nayak, there was also Julio Agyar, a very one of our most sincere Kadia Kartas, a leader, a doer, and uh, probably Mole's greatest friend um, that we, ne we never got to thank enough and he lost his life in the second wave of COVID. Um, so I'd like to thank Julio and the many other organizations, the groups uh, and the individuals that are mentioned here. And I would also like to apologize because I'm sure that I have missed a lot of people who have been part of this citizen's effort. So in this talk, we will explore uh, two things. One is that as a scientist and a practitioner, is there a knowing to doing gap in creating alliances? So that is what I will be talking about. And in the second part, what I will be, uh, what Nishant will be talking about is do artists feel the reverse? Like, is there a doing to knowing gap when, uh, when alliances are forged? And underlying all of this will be what is the action logic of the Yamche Mole campaign that I will take you, I will take you all through and Nishant will take you through. So um, coming to just the uh, aspect of ecology, um, conservation, biology, and how do we support ourselves, how do we situate ourselves with respect to citizenship? Um, so I'll just briefly touch upon Fortunato's concept in, the, in his paper in 2018, um, where he says that the study of science is a science itself. Um, and this paper by Henson in 2019 in Conservation Biology is a paper that uh, machine reads about, I think, 32,000 research articles published in 16 ecology and conservation biology journals from 2000 to, 2000, from 2000 to 2014. Um, so what we find here is between conservation biology and ecology, that based on these clouds, you can see that um, ecology and conservation biology are pretty divergent and now occupy uh, very distinct niches. So now this is a pretty heavy graph, but I want to basically um, uh, point your attention to the topic space that has been explored in uh, ecological journals here. And more conservation oriented uh, journals here. And if you look at the most frequent topics in the conservation space, um, they mostly tie to this green dot here, which is conservation and society. Um, so this pattern probably re uh, results from the increasing recognition that um, social, economic and political factors are critical um, for successful conservation and the way we think about conservation uh, from 2000 to 2014 or probably a longer period of time. So um, 
there have been long standing and pretty enlightening discussions in conservation science and literature uh, about the reluctance of researchers and scientists um, basically to advocate and our own individual self conception of being relatively uninvolved or aloof. Um, something that used to honestly also frustrate me as well. And based on my some of my earlier writings in EPW, um, the sort of strong language that was used in some of those papers um, came from that source. Um, but I recently also came across a paper by Zoe Naisa. And I, I've put the title here because I got pretty, uh, it's a very interesting paper and I really like the title, why scientists succeed yet their organization splinter. So the historical um, and social network analyses of policy advocacy and conservation in the journal Environmental Science and Policy. So what Zoe Naisa did was she that uh, was that she did a larger ethnographic project where she conducted a social network analysis of present day scientists. Um, so she interviewed uh, 153 attendees at the International Congress, uh, the International Conservation Biology Congress um, about their, the resulting affiliations um, between individual scientists, uh, the affiliations that individual scientists hold. And if you look at what this cloud is here, right? Um, it actually shows that of these 153 scientists, and I would argue that this is true for a lot of us, is that individual scientists hold a significant num number of active af uh, affiliations with organizations involved in issues of advocacy. So you could also take this concept forward in terms of individual scientists and the way in which um, they write in the popular medium, uh, the way in which they work with local communities in India, or um, the sort of politics that they advocate of their time. So what she found was that uh, the mean number of affiliations per respondent was about 10. So this level of, advo um, this level of advocacy uh, that we're seeing right now um, in the, pap the paper states that it has been much higher compared to what has been estimated in the literature previously. So this suggests um, that individual researchers are finding ways to informally or formally jump across science policy gaps at a sub-organizational level. Um, so if there's anyone who leads organizations or institutions here, um, this is sort of a good reminder that as we grow in terms of citizenry, voluntary efforts or institutions that or organizations that we want to grow. Um, we need to be pluralistic in terms of being um, acknowledging the varying affiliation networks that we have. Um, and there's a very different picture of conservation work uh, that is evolving today, or maybe it's always been like that. And now it's a function of detection, but it moves away from a single NGO. It moves away from a single organization or a sing single topic. Um, so in addition to the multiple uh, balancing acts that we have to uh, play, uh, whether it is like informally jumping through the sub-organizational level uh, of hoops to get our voices heard, I also think that um, something that we often uh, ignore in some sense is the personal and developmental, personal development challenges that we face. Um, so conservation leaders face collective and personal development challenges. And I see that for myself and with respect to my own practice. Um, on one hand, we need to dispense with traditionally thought or exemplified behaviors related to self-interest um, or hierarchy. Um, and on the other, we're also expected, or it's not expected, but it's more, more like it's also needed that we need to pursue new skills in terms of um, non-traditional training. So some of the skills that I literally had to learn on the job is facilitation, can I think about leadership more critically, think, can I look into aspects of psychology, communication, and the arts, something that is similar to lots of, uh, lots of people, something that is similar to thinking that 
lots of papers have pointed out to in the past. And then um, there's also a, a much neglected point of view, I think, is that how do you really remain effort driven? How do you hold many emotions together um, while uh, forming relationships and while trying to act? So for instance, uh, this is an example that I put forth. Um, often when I seek out counsel, for instance, often when I speak to Claude Alvarez, uh, I seek out, I sort of seek out counsel from a feeling of indebtedness. So these are some of like the feelings that I talk about, a feeling of indebtedness that um, there is somebody like him that I can talk to when I'm confused, a feeling that I can lean on someone, um, a feeling that uh, I, I sometimes feel sulky. I also feel that uh, maybe not Claude, but other people that I have to reach out to is there a feeling of puffness or a feeling of superior superiorness when I have to um, engage with people that I want to get advice from? And it's about uh, also trying to hold these multiple emotions together while um, staying true to serving biodiversity and uh, the multiple other factors that are involved in conservation. So against the personal and developmental challenges that I talked about, um, and also um, the changing discipline of conservation biology in some sense, um, there is what um, many people propose is that, is there a knowing to doing gap, right? Um, that we know a lot, we know, but we don't know um, what to do, right? Um, so, in this paper that I find also very, very helpful um, is that there is that there is a model where the not knowing what to do is called the hathrologic model, right? Um, and it needs to be explained, I feel, and what uh, Mermit says is that it needs to be explained and it needs to be named because it sounds grand and it sometimes takes away um, from the sense of agency that we are able to have in a small context. And it's sort of not naming it also exacerbates the feeling of powerlessness, right? Um, and some of the reasonings of uh, the hathrological model is that often we see statements like humanity should or one could in what they call um, scientists and policymakers or politicians making these whomsoever it may uh, whomsoever it may be recommended to sort of uh, recommendations. So basically um, in, in the paper and basically in uh, some of the thinkings that we have put forth, um, there is a need where conservation needs to enter and we need to enter the fray where we try to get our heads around who are the actors, what are structural links and power dynamics that shape biodiversity outcomes and can be investigated further. Many can be done on a case-to-case -case approach by maybe uh, figuring out specific fields, um, fields of um, or situations that we can act on in a, pra a practical manner, or maybe there could be approaches to improve the pathways of action. So I put forth today, there are many more knowing to doing actions, but I put forth just four um, knowing to doing models of action so that we can think about. So the first model of action was something that I talked about before where the government um, is the operator. Right, so the government could be an actor in which knowledge to inform government decision makers at all stages um, can involve scientists. So scientists can be involved in agenda setting, prioritizing conservation, um, or uh, talking about policy de uh, design. So long as this uh, government as the operator is based on the sound, it's based on sound ecological knowledge or 
or knowledge base and policy evaluation. Um, the second model, the second actionable model is that, that of the governance process. Many of you will be already familiar with this. Influential, uh, sorry, whether community is influential and where rules between resource users themselves is a crux for managing um, a common pool of resources. I will come to this third model. But I bring your attention to the last model, which is the revolution uh, required for change, right? And the revolution required for change is a large model where you look at the political economic regime is seen to be the main source of the problem um, and seems to act and perpetuate a, a set of dysfunctional activities or power relations uh, that are seen that are the root cause of biodiversity loss. Right. Um, so irrespective of the model we choose, whether it's the government as the operator, the governance process, the minority actor for change that I will talk about a bit later, or the revolution required for change, um, there are some critical questions uh, that we need to ask and think about that are organizational or dynamic. Um, and I'm putting this forth because, you know, I really feel that the of the Restoration Alliance that you are putting forth is um, a wonderful opportunity where you can plan, right? Uh, in some sense, we never got the opportunity to, um, or we got the opportunity as we were going in the Mole model, but I think it's a wonderful opportunity to plan about the organizational and uh, dynamic relations with respect to a model of organizing. So, for instance, in there are about seven key questions that could be asked when you think about citizenship or any alliance that you form. Um, who are you expecting to act, right, uh, to produce the changes that you re recommend? Um, who gets to define the issues? Who is expected to lead? Um, who is accountable to whom? What is the place of specialization? of um, conservation scientists, NGOs, right? And these three considerations here really focus on um, problem identification and problem solving. So for instance, what or who causes the biodiversity problem that conservation action intends to address? What course of action could effectively address these biodiversity uh, inducing action, degradation um, and inducing actions. And given the amount of privilege that all of us have, what are privileged forms of action that could be uh, envisaged that are dynamic in nature? So coming to the model that I would I said uh, we will talk about later is that um, the Amche Mole model is not the revolution for all model, but it is the zealot model um, of, of organization that we followed. And what, I, what we call, and what I've called as the organize, organized citizenship behavior. Um, so this model rests on the idea that the initiative of change cannot rest primarily on the government, uh, nor on the circle of the existing power uh, brokers that exist, right? Um, each model here, and each concern can be defended on its own ground in the face of all others. So many times there are questions of, okay, um, why don't you scale up to other issues? But um, there's a lot of times there is convergence with respect to other issues and there is divergence. But um, what our model puts forth is that um, each of these concerns, whether environmental or social, can be defend, uh, defended on its own ground in the face of all others. Um, the affairs detrimental to biodiversity um, is also uh, an acknowledgement that, like what I said earlier, that the existing balances of power um, and interest that the government and powerful stakeholders currently hold are asymmetric compared to that of citizens. Um, so this is a, a common manifesto 
uh, that we have put forth and that citizens have contributed called the ideal campaigner. Um, so it talks about many things. It talks about what happens when you are heckled on social media. Um, and what citizens have decided is that uh, you, you surely get eight hours of sleep and then you respond. Uh, that you're also part of rest and rejuvenation is part of uh, what you do. Um, and what Anushka Hardikar puts very uh, put, puts uh, forth very nicely is that um, the success of this movement will not be will not be when people applaud uh, heroes, but we sort of when we find it weird that people don't take action, and this leads to uh, what we try and envisage in our work um, is to create models of distributed and shared leaderships that moves away from this post-heroic industrial era leadership that usually focuses on one person um, or founder effects or one single leader, uh, where there are hierarchies that uh, one person leads and the rest follow. Um, but we try and be uh, dispersed, collaborative, um, democratic and shared in terms of what we do. The alchemy of such distributed leadership um, requires one obviously to be trust-based. Um, it requires um, you to deal with a wide variety of situations all at once. So it can be stressful at times. Um, it requires also us because there are su such different levels of reaction. not only integration, but an acknowledgement that there are different uh, levels of reality. Um, and it requires um, us to reflect basis. So when we're not, uh, when we're not resting, it, reflect, it requires us to reflect on much more than it maybe requires um, other groups of people coming together um, to reflect on, because we sort of have to think on the job. Um, given the risks of um, activities being scattered or organizational efforts um, losing out, right? And uh, what the Zelic model fo focuses on is that we focus on um, specific actors. Uh, there are certain techniques uh, that, or there are certain uh, processes that need to be better. And there are certain projects that, or, or there are certain issues that we take up. Um, so that does mean that we are, um, as much as most people like to think that they are working systemically, that we are not working systemically. When we do have a discrete periods of time during which uh, there is policy, during which there is policy making chances, for instance, if uh, in the environment and Mole could get into any manifestos of parties. We do work on those time sensitive uh, policy periods um, and uh, put forth the best that we can do during those times. Um, so in some sense, the ambition that we have, uh, which is a pretty small ambition, is inversely proportional um, to the amount of enrollment. So we say we want our ambition to be small. So the enrollment that we have of people um, is high. Sorry, and I just want to draw your attention here to the right part, the right of my screen, which is that uh, the Zelic model and this distributed shared uh, leadership, one, in some cases has been found to be rare. Um, there's also a risk of scattering uh, of managerial and organizational efforts. Um, people involved in this model also, um, there is a good chance of losing touch of your with respect to your primary uh, vocation, whether you're in an organization. And the Zelic model uh, is what people say is an extreme rarity in alchemists. So putting all of this uh, together, uh, with respect to the model of organization that I explained. Um, this is set in 
the Bhagwan Mahavir Wildlife uh, Sanctuary and Malay National Park, which is Goa's oldest protected area. And there's a beautiful lithograph by Antonio Lopez Mendes here um, in, from the 1850s, which gives you a view of Dud Sagar, which is uh, one of is the fifth highest waterfall um, in India and a very important water source and a very important uh, source of identity um, with respect to um, study study tours that Goan children undertake and Dud Sagar being very iconic in our textbooks. Um, so this is a timeline of Malaya National Park and um, of the protected area, which Salim Mali visited in 1972. It does have its challenges with respect to hunting, um, old mines, um, villages have been relocated unfairly, um, and there is also exploration of new uh, opportunities with respect to tourism that are being tried out. Um, it's also a place uh, where uh, it's, it's very beautiful and uh, I can say not only for myself, but uh, many other children. In, in fact, a lot of students from Goa have written um, to the Environment Minister and the Central Empowered Committee of the Supreme Court about how this is a very important uh, study site for them. So these are two dragonfly species that have been described from in and around the protected area um, that are found, where one of which is found, which is described very close to a railway track uh, where one of the projects is situated. So coming to the three projects, the three projects is highway expansion, the railway line and a transmission line. And these are three explainers of, of the number of trees that are meant to be cut that we put forth to citizens um, with respect to the highway, the railway line and the transmission line. Um, so the role of scientists here um, is that we work as specialists, but we also work um, as citizens. So this was a peer review uh, study that was undertaken by um, 31 scientists from 22, uh, in, in, um, 22 institutions um, that was published in the Journal of Threat and Taxa based on the faulty environment impact assessments of the previous studies, right? Um, this went, there's not a linear model of that scientists did this and then it resulted in something else, but this has also uh, been added and critiques have also been added by students, artists, tourism uh, stakeholders and teachers um, about some of these three projects. Um, so these are some images with respect to the three projects. This is the felling of a sub of, for the substation outside the protected area on private land. Um, there is a contempt uh, petition that is being heard in the Supreme Court with respect to this. And in 2000 and, uh, Jan 2022, this is what it looks like with um, succession, with succession looking like uh, the complete takeover by invasives. Uh, this is where one of the projects, uh, which was the transmission line, the forest clearance proposal, and you can see that this is um, unfragmented forest. Um, and I think this bit, this video is not playing, but basically that was a drone. Let me try screening it. So this is a drone shot of the undisturbed forest and the Central Empowered Committee um, of the Supreme Court uh, said that this alignment and this, ali this alignment should not go through and uh, that the existing power line should be uh, an alignment that should be followed. So some of that forest will not uh, be fragmented further. So this is an update, basically the transmission line. It's the, um, the Supreme Court has said that the existing line new, uh, needs to be used. The double tracking project, the Central Empowered Committee has called for the scrapping of the double tracking 
project, not only in the protected area, uh, but right outside it, calling it an economically and ecologically unviable pro uh, project. The Supreme Court scrapped the permission for the national uh, by the National Board for Wildlife, but said that the RBNL can reapply. And the Wildlife Institute of India has started recruitment uh, for a new EIA that will cost about 4.5 crores. Um, and in parallel, in the out, on the outside, just as of a week ago, um, environmental clearance has been given, a stage two environmental clearance has been given um, for double tracking outside the protected area. With respect to road widening, um, there, uh, the Central Empowered Committee of the Supreme Court uh, said that the road could be widened with in, um, increased me measures for mitigation. This has not been heard by the Supreme Court yet. Um, so I will pass this on to Nishant now um, to talk about the second part of um, how do we, the, know, uh, the doing to knowing gap. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I just wanted to say before I uh, continue the presentation, uh, thank you to Nandini and to ERA for having me on um, to represent so many people who make a part of this campaign, what it is and what keeps us together going on uh, two and a half years later. I want to uh, say that I'm an art director on the campaign. Um, and so with that, I'd like to specially thank uh, I think two members who are here, Swabu Kohli and Trisha Dias, because um, uh, I work with them every single day uh, and together we uh, form uh, the group of um, thinkers and doers, but maybe more doers as Nandini was also implying, um, that um, uh, works on what I will be talking about um, going forward. Um, I wanted to talk about um, um, these three areas where we felt like uh, when we were trying to understand how could we translate this idea, it was actually very new and very interesting for us to think of the way we function as alliances in this way, because I think on some level, uh, it didn't come together at the start that way. It was how art functions uh, is to actually work on observation and then respond perhaps with gut and sometimes uh, with a lot of faith and constantly then uh, reorient uh, live like and in the moment when uh, the situation presents itself. And uh, perhaps that not being a scientist, uh, but and being an artist, perhaps that is not how it works uh, in science, uh, but in art, I feel like um, we are able to do that and that's why the sort of um, combination of science and art and the way in which we work complement each other and kind of support each other almost like uh, in a sort of form of balancing forces. So I'm going to talk first about the alliances between art and science in the, uh, in the Amche Mola campaign because uh, I've come to feel like it is almost like the DNA of the campaign. And um, right now uh, here is like perhaps like our shining example of uh, a very large scale singular work. And when I say large scale, I just mean that is very uh, detailed, but actually it's also a digital work, um, uh, no, which is used to describe fragmentation of a forest. And uh, basically it was a seven page research paper written by three scientists and an architect that an artist Zai Borkar took on and um, returned actually in a single image. And I think this is the best way in which um, um, we can talk about like what art does and the power of what images do. Uh, if we could move to the next slide. So um, I would encourage you to just look at the expanse of this image. Um, and like what is uh, incredible about images is that we read it actually all at once completely, unlike a paper or text, which where we have to go word by word. And then we're able to move in and out based on our own cognition, based on our own experiences and based on our own um, history of reading images. Um, so the artist is very clear about what they have put in. They have put everything in. But when a viewer approaches it, 
the approach with the entirety of their being, however complex and specific that is. And that is the way in which we actually engage with images first. And so you may keep returning to the same image and finding more things based on uh, your own history of experiences. So I think uh, going back to a personal anecdote, I think when I saw it, um, I recognized the trucks which are so accurately depicted, the exact trucks that I have seen when driving from Belgaum to Goa on the same highway. Uh, and I kind of immediately was able to make those correlation of dust, of lumber, of uh, roadkill. And so the image got me there, but it takes a while and then you realize that there's a train in the background and then you start to notice everything in between um, that uh, when a bear comes in and is being poached, it allows human uh, to, humans to actually spend time there uh, carrying on activity. And the moment you start to fragment a forest with one project or with one sort of human form of development, it slowly opens it up. I remember also learning so much that I had not learned uh, in this uh, by just looking at this image again and again. Uh, one is that the tall trees that you see over there are emergent trees uh, and that uh, they go far above the canopy or that there are many forms of flying or rather gliding reptiles that exist in the forest. So really like art uh, forms as a way in which you actually discover um, through the sense of discovery. Um, uh, could we move to the next slide? And what was great about this image is that it is so detailed and so uh, packed uh, with rich scientific um, material that has actually been used, depicted with almost the, um, the quality of children's book or fantasy illustration, um, is that uh, we could zoom into parts of this and actually have a scientific discussion or an explanation over several weeks. I think it ran for about uh, a month and a half, like an episodic breakdown of this one single image that alerted people to really what is at stake. Um, and I'd like to say that our campaign started in the lockdown in the height of the first lockdown. And so it was very natural that our first responses were online because actually that is where uh, everyone was actually able to be together and to gather. And as the pandemic sort of rolled out and it felt safer to step out, we could actually uh, do what we, have known uh, is really powerful again, not just about art, but about uh, human presence. I think it's uh, on some level the same thing um, that we could take this out in physical forms to the world. So on one side, you have this image being used in the letter to the president when he um, uh, came to Goa, I think to inaugurate the new high court. Um, um, this zine, which was titled Voices for Goa, was handed to him with this being the primary image of uh, destruction in order to carry, carry our message. We also like then realized we could print this image very large and we took it to our very first ever small pop-up space at the Liberty and Light Festival um, in Goa in Panjim. And what was really great about this is what we were doing online uh, as broken up episodes, we could uh, physically be there and almost like have a walkthrough of this artwork. And so um, we put this image up and we, uh, whenever somebody came to our stall, we would show them uh, through the image. And since then this large canvas print kind of has, uh, follows us everywhere and becomes a very important way in which we introduce people to what, what it is we're doing. Um, on the left, you see it at the Goa Heritage um, Festival. Uh, it, comes with an accompanying zine which explains the image which hangs by the easel and you can read uh, read it through and take yourself to the image or like you see on the right um, you have um, uh, it at Liberty and Light Festival where we left it up on the wall and we noticed that what is so uh, interesting about this uh, spirit of Amche Mole is that and what actually images do as opposed to uh, maybe just data is that it allows you to take ownership of it very easily. Uh, and so various other people um, were um, doing walkthroughs. On the, I think on the bottom left, if you see, uh, that's the author Jerry Pinto who was visiting. And I remember walking in and uh, hearing him take a child through the idea of what chlorophyll is, which is not what I would have ever thought about doing, but that's like how rich uh, this one image is or what images can be um, as a tool of learning. So um, with that, um, I think this is where um, not being a scientist and uh, being an artist 
I find like a lot of our everyday work when it's not breaking down complex information, uh, scientific, um, is using art as a bridge basically between society uh, and the idea of the governance of society and sort of enabling citizens to be very much part of that. So here I would say art is used um, as a tool or rather as a vehicle of um, accessibility and of guidance. And I'll take you through a few examples now. Um, um, if you go to the next slide. So um, similarly to like uh, how I described um, the fragmentation of a forest image we saw earlier, like I think the, the real bread and butter of the Amche Mola campaign, at least on social media, uh, and when we were all locked up, were these um, incredibly like exciting looking uh, poppy and attractive uh, explainers that were used to break down complex scientific and legal information using art using the sort of language of comics, using the idea that um, images and text can work together to convey not just material, but also uh, emotionally help you uh, to be with that material and what it is trying to say on a subliminal level, as well as make it easier to uh, access and understand uh, complex systems. Uh, and uh, we would use this regularly to break down and explain uh, high court notices, uh, court updates, where we were at the campaign. I would encourage you to read some of these. These are the titles of the explainers. Um, facts about power, what an environmental impact assessment is. Um, um, explaining just to everyone uh, on our campaign, and then we had a large following on Instagram around maybe 14,000 people. It helped us to explain what the Central Empowered Committee of the Supreme Court is, which was such a ve very vital journey uh, for a whole year, actually, uh, with the campaign. We, we were able to talk about it by uh, using the, these uh, sort of image and text combinations. Um, if we go to the next slide. Um, we'll see um, we'll see over here what these looked like when you would swipe right on in Instagram. Uh, you would have a cover and then you would have text uh, and images um, taking you through it. And I think the CEC ones were very important. Uh, and uh, Deepti Sharma, who is also part of our art team, was um, our main go-to for all of these explainers, really. And I think it, it is an approach to uh, softening really uh, complex and heavy material that made these very um, successful. Uh, moving forward. Nandini? Yeah, Nishant, I've moved forward. Is that visible? Oh, for some, I'm sorry. For some reason, there's a lag and I'm not able to see the next slide. Okay, I see it now. Okay. So um, while I very much wanted to uh, talk about uh, the digital work that the campaign uh, was very instrumental in producing in the beginning uh, part, I think it would be um, almost um, equally important to talk about the sort of multiplicity of forms uh, that the campaign allows uh, art to exist in and in very much a real way and as a real presence on the ground. And I think this ties also back to the very like um, rich and very beloved heritage of self-expression uh, that Goans have celebrated for years. Like actually every Indian that uh, celebrates, if you really look wherever you go uh, in, in uh, festivals, in local um, 
rituals in uh, political um, action, there's this uh, history of being out, being present, uh, and making something. And so um, it is not only um, uh, that we can ascribe this maybe to Western history of protest, but that very much like this spirit of being on the ground and making something of yourself uh, an expression, but speaking for the larger community is very much Goan and very much Indian. Um, and uh, here you see art just simply made by anyone. It doesn't require you to be an artist or a thinker or a designer. It's really like what I think um, I remember early on talking about uh, when we would discuss in our campaigns about active citizenship. It just means that um, whatever you can do and whatever you do, you can bring that to the campaign and that there's no one prescribed way uh, to lend your voice. So there have been people uh, who, who dressed up in their traditional costume and danced on the railway tracks while 5,000 people gathered there with candles. And it is a form of celebration as a form of, um, as a form of resilience and as a form of speaking out. There's also, of course, the chart papers. There's this work by Ashish Faldesai, a, a young artist who worked with uh, local tribal communities in Kotigao to make masks and make these artworks. And he posed with them speaking about what um, uh, infrastructure in the forest does to communities who reside there. Um, so I would like to just talk about how important and how, um, um, how these works show that art is actually uh, not an object, but a verb. Um, and I think that's a very important way to look at how art can be actionable and um, going forward. So uh, to kind of sum up uh, this idea of political engagement to, uh, to uh, through art, I'd like to just go uh, quickly through this one case study of ours, which we had where um, uh, it was called Flood Your MLA. And in, I think the second year, July 2021, Goa had uh, had an unprecedented rainfall and I think uh, rivers overflowed and uh, dams were opened and the hinterland of Goa suffered very severe flooding very quickly that destroyed many people's homes, livelihoods, crops, vegetation. One of the most iconic images, if uh, any of you all remember, was that a train going through Dudsagar was thrown off the tracks and sunk into the mud. And we realized at this moment, while Nandini was talking about ambition being small and our narrative being very uh, close to, um, we are here to talk about the three projects within the national park and talk about why it's not good to fragment a forest. We realized at this moment it presented a way to frame the same story within the larger issue of climate change, a very much uh, vital way of um, uh, looking at this if we wanted to look at the bigger picture while remaining focused on the area that we had set out to do. And so, because it was timed with, the floods were timed with legislative assembly sessions, um, we had already been tracking, again, using visuals and explaining what the campaign is really good at doing and has chosen to do regularly is to really break down the systems of governance and make it very easy for anyone. If I have to be really honest, I really didn't know exactly what an MLA does until I had to like, work on the campaign and see exactly what an MLA's role is and how important it is to what happens uh, with policy in the state. And so the tracking of legislative assembly sessions would happen and we would um, record questions that brought up that were brought up about more or less start and unstarred questions. This is a year before the floods. Um, if we move forward, we would also see when the flooding happened, we asked, we went through again to show people how they could find out who the MLA was using the prescribed government websites. And then we created a sample template and we asked people to um, send, uh, send their uh, grievances about the floods to the thing and when we, to their MLA. And when we found out that many emails were bouncing, we realized this is where like the doing first and knowing and thinking in retrospect aspect of art helps you to solve problems immediately, especially when there's a time pressure. We just said if the formal method of reaching your representative is not possible, we can at least try our best to reach them informally. And so we suggested that citizens could just tag, take photographs of their flooded villages and their cities 
and tag their uh, uh, representatives who we know are on social media and write to them directly, hoping that they would at least see that. And so as this process went on, when the emails bounced, we created these templates um, that were about the important questions that we had been campaigning to be brought up at least by the third legislative assembly session. Uh, bring up the CEC recommendations, address climate change, address the CEC issues, and uh, talking about climate change and the links to deforestation and flooding. Um, here you see at the same time, the same set of questions, you found this very amazing on ground action as well. While we were going on Instagram, we would also have citizens approach their MLAs in person and put forth the questions that they wish to be discussed. I think this is a very important exercise in realizing a small action is what really helps this idea of democratic self-determination, which is that we want to uh, voice uh, uh, within this democratic system what we want the future of the state to be. And uh, uh, because of having measured this for over a year and this sort of accumulative impact uh, of small actions, um, when the floods happened and the legislative assembly session started, um, it was quite amazing to watch it and see that though it was not brought up often before and usually kept for the end, the Amche Mole issue and the debate began five minutes uh, into, the, uh, into the session starting and became a very heated argument for about 40 minutes. And we recorded all the various um, representatives' um, responses to it. So this brings me uh, to the final thing. And I think it's also touching on what uh, Nandini was talking about. Um, and this is where for us, I think uh, on the art team, it becomes a bit more um, personal and self-reflective. I think it's really important, especially when uh, Nandini talking about the Zelic model of um, issues that can be difficult for this, uh, this kind of a model. It's very important to constantly be reflective of um, where you are coming from and what is it that you're actually doing so that you can course correct or not, or just uh, wonder how you have changed within the process. So um, we were very lucky to have been part of the Serendipity Arts Festival this year. And we decided to use that to work with the scientists on our group and use that opportunity to talk about the environmental impact assessments and how they are so often uh, flawed in India because of unscientific methods of conducting them and how that is often used at the detriment of India's forests. And we decided to highlight precisely because uh, the sense, sense that the railways were again seeking to conduct a new EIA despite the Supreme Court, Court ruling. Um, we wanted to bring out what was flawed about the first three, uh, first three impact assessments and talk about why doing another impact assessment would not necessarily be a solution. So we focused on um, very fascinating species uh, that were left out of the enti assessments entirely, like there was not no mention of them. Uh, and we call the project, uh, uh, which was a public interactive uh, art installation, the case of the missing species. And we worked with very scientific information researched and written by the scientists on our group. And we uh, created information in the form of booklets and address books talking about these species and what was, what was interesting about them, what was so unique about them, and also what was ironic. For example, the gore, which you saw a picture of earlier on these empty boards, um, um, to imply almost that they are cut out or left out, is uh, an animal which is the state animal of Goa and has the highest protection in the country, the same as that of uh, the national animal, the tiger. Yet it, uh, there was no mention of the gore at all in one of the em environmental impact assessments for the three projects. Um, so it was us pointing out to the sort of great irony of it and uh, wondering why and in whose benefit is uh, such information left out. So if you came to the installation, you would find many postcards, each with a different species that was missing from the EIA. You would find an address book and you would find scientific data showing you what the environmental impact states or data showing you what the environmental impact states and juxtaposed against actual scientific findings in the forests and in the national park and it was a question of 
you read the science and decide um, what you want uh, to say about it on these postcards. And then you can look at the address book and write to any of the representatives at the national or the state level um, or, or the wildlife board um, uh, who, is, who was conducting the, uh, the wildlife institute was conducting the EI, uh, impact assessment. And um, it was amazing. I would like to say that because we were positioned at Municipal Gardens, which is known as Garcia da Orta, there was a vast section of society from every sort of strata that anyway occupies the park that passes to the park that would come up to our installation, read through it, find out about it, and um, write a postcard. And it really was this idea of reinforcing to us uh, these small actions where, like Nandini said, the ambition is small, but the enrollment is large. I think over six days that we were there, we had uh, almost 850, 900 individual postcards written and many, many more people who spent a lot of time over there. Um, you could come to the table, stamp it and hang your postcard up. Uh, moving forward. I think the one uh, theme that I want to speak specifically about um, in this presentation is uh, that of uh, contemporary art practice. And uh, that was the self-reflective aspect uh, that I meant um, of uh, in a festival context, um, um, uh, what, is it, uh, what does it mean to have a contemporary art practice? If we are artists and, and often in contemporary practice, you will find that the artist is positioned as an outsider to the situation, looking in someone who is an observer and someone who's commenting on the reality of it. But I find that the Amche Mole campaign really teaches us and helps us know that artists can have their practice and make their commentary, but you can also be very much part of the inside, shaping the world as a citizen and uh, uh, being part of uh, determining how you would like to uh, live and how society would like to live um, in the future. And um, I would like to end on that note and pass it back to Nandini. So I'd just like to um, sum up and with some internal and collective ponderings for the group. Um, so one is uh, through what we've uh, tried to position today and what we'd like to share, uh, what we shared today is what are alliances and models of organizing meant to do? Can we ask ourselves those questions? Um, in many cases, what are some of the implications of a mediated outcome? Uh, with respect to the site, uh, how do we understand the active that exists in other place, uh, parts of India? Um, and really, uh, at the outset of uh, starting this alliance and all the work that uh, you all have been doing, uh, we have had the opportunity of thinking about conflict resolution, but you all have the opportunity of preempting organizing. Um, and we've just sort of given you all a glimpse today of what is the effort that goes into making things happen. Um, also, uh, some of the questions that we are upon upon in campaign, and we, there might be some shared learning, is how can leadership and how can environmental governance be also looked at in terms of moral and ecological issues, and not just strategic and technical implications with respect uh, to engagement with respect to so uh, with respect to forest conservation, um, and finally. Uh, it's whether it's ERA or whether it's Amjai Mole, uh, do the spaces that we have created and then such, such spaces of organized citizenship uh, behaviors have creative potentials or respirative potentials of maybe alliances that were broken in the past uh, that are bigger uh, than the singularity of our own practice and the singularity of who we are. Hello. Um, I think we lost Nandini. Is she still online? Yeah, I think she's dropped off. Um, 
Now, I would like to start by saying it's it was really wonderful hearing about the entire journey and how even, you know, very small things of even trying to make, uh, making it easier for people to, uh, making it easier for people to become a part of the campaign in whatever kind of format. And those were, that was a really interesting, uh, you know, uh, there was a really interesting insight in trying to, how do you kind of get people involved? There were some questions, were, these were some of the questions that were coming in in the forms, uh, in the Google form that we had shared earlier as well. Uh, but I'd like to open it up to anyone else right now. Uh, so first, thank you, Nishant, thank you, Nandi. And I'd want to open it up to others for questions if they have any right now. Okay, while people are starting, I, I do have a few questions already. And uh, is it okay if we take, I know we're already over time, but is it okay if we take another five, 10 minutes to just have some questions? Of course. Of course. Okay. So uh, I, want, I want to understand more around the Zelig model and distributed leadership. I mean, I'm just curious as to how that works and how does everyone come in alignment to what is going on? How does, how does that happen for you? Um, so, uh, as far as exactly what the Zelic model is about, I think that's more Nandini's forte. Um, and I think that's very interesting because I, I have to be honest, I've only, I only heard that word today when we were revising the, uh, thing, uh, revising the presentation, hmm. but, uh, when she was describing it, I understood that, um, our campaign very much resembles it. And I would say from my experience, um, what really has worked for us is like, uh, as Nandini said, like the ambition is small. Of course, it's not actually as small as we state it is because it is on some level, I think, again, some of the most sort of Um, hi, Nandi. Welcome back. Uh, yeah, Nishant, I think we lost you now. Okay. Nishant, we lost you in the middle. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Um, I think I'll also pass it uh, to Nandini. I just wanted to say one other thing. Uh, like, I often wonder, like, what it is still, aside from the idea of decentralization, of lowering that idea of immense, the immense, like, struggle or the immense sort of goal when it can sometimes feel like what one thing that helps is, helps is uh, working in the small groups that we do. But the other thing I think that uh, I think has kept everyone going, and I think it's a very undervalued uh, uh, maybe maybe seen as a sentiment but i think it just must be like something as like blunt as just love for goa or you know love for the environment and maybe the fear that uh it can be lost and i think uh if you talk to anyone on the campaign that it'll uh this will come up as a very obvious uh, reason to keep doing it so in terms of like uh the zelic model i don't know nandini um if you had anything more to add to that how does um, responsibility get dispersed? Um, yeah, I think the model of having many leaders doing many different things and the capacity to encourage leadership is something that is something that I actually find uh, very invigorating about the campaign and something that keeps uh, all of us going so there's not one cent uh, central oh, I have I have learned and there are many things about myself that I, I keep learning as a sense of energy to me and many others 
But uh, how is it that, you know, in this model, for example, I mean, you're saying that there are small groups, but how is it that it all comes and aligns together in the direction that you have to take it, uh, and that it has to take, or is that also very open? Um, it's uh, happy to actually uh, take this conversation forward and uh, onboard you all to some a campaign and showing you all some of the nuts and of what it is. You all, I'm very happy if any of you want to email me um, and get a more deeper understanding because it's sort of difficult to explain how it um, all comes together. Uh, mm -hmm. But I would also say that uh, it involves a lot of time uh, that each of each of us um, gives uh, that is connected to citizenship and the sense of uh, um, volunteership. Uh, and there is a lot of planning that uh, goes on behind what we do, which makes it seem organic on one hand, but on the other, there is quite a lot of structure um, that is happening in the background. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions from anyone? You can uh, unmute yourself and ask directly also. Uh, I think another question that had come up in the Google Forms that we'd sent out for registration is, uh, how is it that, uh, how do you, oh, sorry, okay, Divya, Shridhar, go ahead before I ask this question. Yeah, hi. Uh, hi, Nandini and Nishan. Thanks so much. That was a, a wonderful and uh, very illuminating talk. Uh, about citizenship campaigns and how it connects to conservation. I also like the way you spoke about bringing science and art together uh, for effective, uh, you know, campaigns and involving citizens. Uh, I was struck by one thing that you mentioned, Nandini, about uh, conflict resolution. You said that, uh, you know, there is conflict resolution, which tends to be reactive. You're reacting to a situation. You're trying to, you know, pull something together versus uh, what you mentioned as a sort of preemptive campaigning, which uh, I understood to mean something more proactive, uh, taking some steps forward before something bad happens, so to speak. Now, how does one do that? Typically, you know, most conservation campaigns, they tend to be reactive. Something's going wrong, so we get together and we often we are just opposing something that's coming forward. Uh, or which is out there. Now, if you want to build a proactive campaign, uh, there may often not be a single, you know, sort of a target. There may not be a particular immediacy or urgency. It has to, um, e even that sense of urgency and immediacy may have to be uh, dealt uh, or built for, uh, for a proactive campaign to work. So I, I'd like your thoughts on that. Uh, what exactly were you trying to say when you said you have the opportunity for more preemptive uh, efforts uh, when you're talking of alliances. Um, so it sort of ties into your, um, your question slash comment about uh, there is a great opportunity of uh, thinking about organized citizenship behaviors with respect to a pre, uh, like a proactive a lot of the initiatives that we have through the labs that we have or through uh, the sites that we're interested in or through our institutions or um, through our NGOs. So I do feel that looking at OCBs and exploring OCBs um, in the form that ERA has taken in, ter in terms of creating an alliance um, has an opportunity to be proactive in terms of thinking about ways in which citizens can contribute because there are many times that citizens write to us and say that whether you're an artist or whether um, you're a, a student where they just want to contribute but uh, it's not a response it's not necessarily a response to a linear project or a bad NBWL decision but uh, it's a response to the times and uh, that we live in. 
So I think that uh, there is a great opportunity uh, if you all are able to think about your model of working, um, of creating a proactive alliance with very specific call to action. So I do think that there are some similarities uh, where our, maybe our call to action is, is reactive, but your call to action could be proactive with respect to what citizens can do by breaking down the paths like we've tried to do in the Mole campaign. Thanks, thanks, uh, Nandini. Certainly something to think about, yeah, thank you. Um, okay, if there are no other questions, I just have that last question that I had started off on, and then maybe we can call it after that. Uh, does anyone else have any other questions before I go? I mean, it's Okay, so uh, the question that uh, had come up in the Google form uh, often was, uh, and it was basically about how do you convince, and it's about people, and how do you kind of convince people who may have not had the benefit of uh, the infrastructure development taking place in their area, right? So how do you convince the communities of people to... Uh, be to kind of support a project where they might feel that they might have a more economic incentives if that development came through and uh, how is it that how is it that infrastructure development and uh, you know conservation or restoration can go hand in hand so these were the two things that were coming up as a theme um so in uh, some sense the three projects that um, have uh, been that have come up, in many cases, if you speak to people in Goa and if you speak to people living around uh, these places, uh, they are uh, completely unaware. So, for instance, when the surveys of some of these projects were being done with respect to the transmission line, um, the uh, way in which the government decided to do this uh, survey that was being undertaken by Sterlite Power, a special, uh, of which Goa Samnar is a special purpose vehicle, uh, is that they decided to give the project proponents police protection um, to ask uh, whether or not they wanted uh, these, whether or not they wanted uh, these projects. So um, in that sense, um, there is a, a shared sense of, there is a shared sense of on one hand, alienation in terms of how um, these projects are um, imposed, alienation that exists at multiple scales. At uh, If you talk to people in the state government, they say that, oh, these are central projects. If you talk uh, to people at different scales, they say that this we don't know who the benefit of these, um, we don't know who the benefits of these projects are. Um, so in some sense, in these uh, three projects, uh, the way in which these projects are envisaged and constructed are very problematic in the way they deal with um, citizens, um, with, with the citizens of Goa. I think we've gone way over time also, and uh, I would really like to thank you uh, both Nishant and Nandi for coming here and representing the views of Amche Molam, because I, like you said, there are so many people who are a part of this and who have been uh, part of this journey, and it's not just, um, yeah. So thank you so much for this talk. It was really uh, it was really great to hear you and to hear your uh, opinions. Hopefully there will be a lot. I mean, we would love to, I mean, I would definitely love to come and join in on one of these meetings and see how those nuts and bolts work and how does it all come together. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, thank you so much for sharing all your learnings with us. Thank, thank you, you so everybody. Much. And I wish all of you good luck in forming the Alliance and taking things forward. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Thank everyone, you. for joining in.